arrived five minutes late. That's my fault. Ellen's on vacation this week, enjoying herself in warm weather somewhere, so uh, we'll send her our good wishes. Um, so I'm here, uh, my name is Eric, um, I'm here to present Brooke, Brooke Slavodian. You can, thank you, thank you. So thank you for him. You can pronounce his name in uh, a million different ways, because people always do, but it is Slavodian. Um, Brooke, uh, I met him because uh, he was taking the class that uh, five years ago I took over uh, teaching and managing in the ceramic studio downstairs. And Brooke and his mom Amy were, uh, had been long enrolled in that class, kind of doing this uh, uh, mother-son uh, bonding moment. Um, and uh, so I've seen him uh, work in the studio down there. And um, like everybody that I talked to about Brooke, was really impressed with this young man. Uh, he's got a lot of really uh, great qualities to his personality. He's very sensible. Um, he approaches things in a, in a, in a very methodic way. Uh, and I know a lot, of, a lot about him now, the way he works, because he has worked with me on a couple of the large projects that um, I was able to accomplish a lot because of his help with me there uh, by my side. Um, <clears throat> I learned uh, about Brooke that he took some um, knife making classes. This is one of the first things I learned about him when he was like, you said 12? 12. <laughs> when he was 12, he, he went, uh, his, his parents uh, are, they're good people and they expose their children to, to interesting things. So he got to take some knife making classes from s some master knife makers. Um, and are you gonna show us some of the knives no, by chance? Okay, some other time you'll see his yeah. knives. They really are masterful, masterful works. And then you think, wait, you were 12? when you started doing this, so he's kind of moved on from knife making, um, but it's apparent in the work that he does, the way that he, he can make metal do certain things that most people can't, um, unless they have the practice that he has. Um, and uh, he'll talk about this piece here, which is combining the clay and metal together. And you know, just to go back to what I've witnessed with, with how he thinks, he approaches things um, in, in a way that, um, is, is abnormal in a good way. Um, he's, he's, he oftentimes makes me feel really dumb, we'll put it that way too. I mean, you're smarter than me, I think. Um, so it, it's a, it, it should be a pleasure to, to hear him talk about his work. Um, he doesn't have the, um, normally when you do the thing, you say, oh, he graduated from here with a degree in this. You would expect that looking at the work that he's done, but um, uh, not, not necessarily self-taught folk artist, but um, a lot of this is self-taught and just through trial and error um, and kind of pushing himself and seeing what comes, comes of it. So uh, without any uh, further delay, Brooke Slobodian. Thank you, thank you. Wow, Eric, that was a very complimentary. Thank you so much. Uh, as he said, yeah, we've worked together for now a few years. Uh, Eric has taught me so much in terms of uh, processes, working through problems, doing these absolutely massive, I don't know if you guys have seen his uh, installations both at the uh, convention center parking garage and uh, down in the short north on 5th and High, these absolutely, you know, colossal monolithic pieces that I couldn't even envision, but somehow he had the idea for and made happen, made it, made it come to life. It's, it's pretty, pretty astronomical what he can accomplish. Um, so I'm really happy to have him as a teacher, as a mentor. Um, he has further also inspired to inspired me to go on to kind of work on my own stuff apart from the cultural Arts center, which is fantastic. But I really do like having a home studio. Those of you who might have a home studio, it's nice to be able to walk from the studio, grab a cup of tea or something, go back instead of having to go downtown and then go back. Um, so I started down an exploration in ceramic arts when I was about 14. I uh, started taking classes at CCAD, and uh, thanks to my, my parents who were encouraging and wanted us to do artsy things and develop interests. You know, they didn't let us have video game systems, and at the time I cursed them for it. <laughs> now I thank them for it, because we actually developed interests and hobbies. Uh, my brother and I, who's, he's also a fantastic artist. He's a painter and sculptor, and, you know, multimedia artist. Anyways, I decided to go on this little journey of doing alternative firings in ceramics um, on my own. 
basically, I'll have, it's a lot of, a lot of slides. I feel like I'm giving a lecture, which I kind of am. So I put in here, conventional firing methods in modern times generally consist of heating in an electric or gas-fired kiln. And these techniques are reliable. They produce beautiful finishes, functional pieces, and there's, you know, you could spend your lifetime using these techniques and, and creating beautiful art and beautiful functional pieces that people can enjoy for years and years and years to come. Um, alternative techniques, it's a very broad term. However, it kind of encapsulates everything that that is not. <laughs> um, it's taking pieces out of the kiln while they're hot. It's firing in the outdoors, with sometimes very little or no shelter. There's uh, um, even festivals where they build gigantic sculptural kilns that then they break down afterwards. It's a one-time kind of thing. But as I said, alternative, firing techni uh, alternative techniques of firing take their cues from ancient and varied cultures and their different available resources and needs. The processes are usually unpredictable, which is fun and sometimes heartbreaking. Um, so can you turn so on the lights a little bit? Is that okay with everyone? You can turn the lights on a little? Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go over a few different types of alternative quote unquote alternative firings that we don't see so much of in the modern times. First one is wood firing. Uh, this is an example of uh, what they call a naboragama kiln. This is a traditional Japanese style, what they call a hill climb kiln. Um, this one happens to have three separate chambers for work to be placed in. And this is one of the oldest ways of firing, usable, you know, functional, long-term ceramics. You would see you know, Korean celadons dating back thousand years, they would be fired in something very similar to this called an anagama, or another type of kiln, very, very similar though. These, these babies, I fired uh, one of these once, and it was just an absolute joy. You fired over three straight days, has to be stoked every two minutes for 72 hours, um, and it uses up uh, as much wood would fit in this room, basically. But the, the results are just absolutely incredible. You get some real unpredictability, some real uh, some surprises in the flashing and the colors that come out of it, and the textures are just, you can't match it in, in traditional, uh, conventional firings, um, though you can come close. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is one, it can, as I said on here, it can reach upwards of cone 12, 20, roughly 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. Now it can actually go higher, but then you start damaging the inside of the kiln. And it's amazing that you can do this through natural aspiration. There's no fans, there's no electricity powering this thing. It's simply designed and built so the airflow just keeps cranking the heat up, goes up and up and up and up with wood. You wouldn't think it could do that, but it's pretty amazing. This is one, uh, this is a piece, the photo is a piece that I did in one of those Naboragama kilns. And you can see it's kind of shiny. It's kind of maybe hard to tell in the photo, but there was actually no glaze applied to that piece whatsoever. And actually the fire and ash, and they put, uh, actually they put salt into the kiln at the very last stage, coated the piece and created its own glassy glaze. It's a totally functional piece. It can hold water, it can hold food, whichever, whatever you want to do. It's just funny that they go in looking completely different. <laughs> um, that kiln actually got to about almost cone 13, which is way hotter than they thought it was going to be, so a lot of pieces didn't make it. <laughs> Any kind of platters or plates that were fairly wide became wide well, the other direction. <laughs> they just all slumped, uh, became molten. Um, and again, this is something that is still practiced today in the traditions from thousands of years ago. Um, this is another type of firing. Uh, this is not one of mine, though I have done pit firing myself. Uh, I could not find a good picture of any of my stuff. Um, this is where you would dig a fairly large pit in the ground, fill it with combustibles, um, wood, straw, paper, um, anything that'll catch fire, basically, and pack a whole bunch of pieces in and around there, and then you would sprinkle in you know, salt, uh, which would give a beautiful red color and some texture to the piece or different copper, uh, copper chloride, copper sulfate, which imbues blue greens and some wonderful different textures to them too. Um, so as well as uh, banana peels, um, <laughs> copper wire, steel wool, 
these all fume as the, as the fire gets hotter and causes chemical reactions in the clay and, and imparts different beautiful colors and tones. Um, again, in a very unpredictable and sometimes very satisfying way, but sometimes not. <laughs> um, let's see. Sagar fire, which is a bit similar and in its terms of its using all manner of different chemicals to create tones on the piece. If there were no chemicals in these firings, it would generally turn a pale pink, depending on the kind of clay you're using, but for the most part would remain pretty monochromatic, pretty, pretty blah. <laughs> so they add in, this one would have had um, iron, where you see all the kind of tendrils, blue, or not blue, but the red and black and brown tendrils, those would have been wrapped in probably um, probably a steel wool of some sort, something like that. And that, again, imbued itself into the clay and left this really cool pattern. Again, very unpredictable. That one, Sagar firing, is also when you place a piece like that into a larger either clay vessel or metal vessel, and actually fire that inside the kiln. So it's separate from the atmosphere in the kiln, but it, 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 uh, it flares and it fumes and it heats up enough to cause those chemicals inside to alight and create these patterns and colors. Um, smoke firing, which I put on here, similar to pit firing. This technique involves surrounding ceramic ware with combustibles and lighting it on fire. Slow burning materials, such as they would use manure or straw, even sometimes damp straw, because that would, use, that would use, um, create a lot of black smoke. Uh, slow burning materials cause massive amounts of smoke to infiltrate the surface of the clay and turning it black and most of, often associated with native civilizations in the American West and in Mexico. Uh, this technique was being used all over the world. You'll see examples of this um, from the Southeast Pacific. You'll see this in examples in uh, the Middle East and Africa. Um, same idea, it's that these huge, and I mean again, massive firings, firings that would fill up this entire room of hundreds, if not thousands of pieces layered on top of each other then covered with this uh, combustible material and set alight. And again, it would take days. It might even take a week for this stuff to cool down eventually, enough to handle. And these pieces that are beautifully burnished are now you know, still in museums, still shiny, uh, even though they would seem fragile. <laughs> um, what I'm really here to talk about is Raku firing. Um, Raku, uh, I'll say on this, or Raku Yaki, was a Japanese tradition, a uh, way of making functional wear for tea ceremonies and household use. Uh, these traditional pieces were molded by hand, meaning they weren't thrown on a wheel, they were hand built. So they started off as pinch pots. Uh, essentially, if you guys have any familiarity with that, um, they were glazed in simple iron or copper based uh, glazes, which either turned them generally black or dark red. Uh, there was really not a lot of frills to these pieces. They didn't have a lot of decoration, you know, no designs carved in them, no exterior decorations. They were pretty much bowls that were black and red. However, they were prized over some of the more elaborate, you'd see celadons and some beautiful porcelain ware from that time too. These were prized above those a lot of times because of their simplicity, their understatedness. Um, they were used in the highest forms of uh, ceremonial, you know, tea ceremonies and, um, and get-togethers. It was just a really cool idea to bring the earth back into these types of uh, elegant and sophisticated ceremonies. The American Raku, what we call American Raku, is taking from the Japanese tradition, kind of modifying it though, um, mostly American Raku is not functional for the most part, meaning you can't usually eat out of it. <laughs> you wouldn't want to. Uh, it remains pretty porous in terms of its, uh, its clay type. It doesn't get what they call vitrified. It doesn't fully turn to stone in its firing. It never quite gets hot enough to, to do that. Um, so American Raku was inspired by Japanese tradition uh, in the 1960s and 70s, an artist called Paul Sodner, um, or Soldner, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. Soldner, Soldner. okay. Um, thought, well, I can take these Japanese techniques of Rakuyaki, taking the piece out of the kiln hot, 
and I can, yeah, I can try that. And he wasn't really happy with the results. Never kind, never got the beautiful black and the beautiful red tones and the slight uh, differences between the two. So he thought, okay, well, I'll roll them in some dry leaves to try to bring out that smokiness, to bring out that kind of contrast. And what he stumbled on was a way of, uh, of life for a lot of artists these days. Uh, so both processes involve removing ceramic pieces from the kiln while hot, and we're talking 1600, 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, about cone 06 to cone 04. Um, and exposing them to different atmospheres, atmospheres being how much oxygen is in the clay. And there's reduction atmospheres where you take away most of the oxygen, and then there's oxidation atmospheres where you pump in a lot of air, and they both give different tones, um, such as a copper glaze in an oxidation. You've all seen copper oxidize. It turns green or blue-green. So in an oxidation environment, a copper glaze is prone to turning blue-green. In a reduction environment, you steal all the oxygen away from it, and it turns bright red. Um, it's an interesting play between art and, and chemistry that's just, I don't know, it never gets old to me. I don't know about anyone else. <laughs> Um, and there's a lot of different approaches to doing this kind of, of technique. Horsehair raku, where you take the piece out of the kiln and you drape horsehair over it. It causes these, these black lines. Uh, the horsehair just vaporizes almost instantaneously, leaving these black, veiny style lines all over the piece. And it's just, it's so well done when, uh, it's so pretty when it's well done. It's just, I don't know. It, uh, there's something to it, something whimsical about it, something ancient looking. Um, copper reduction raku, um, where pieces are coated in copper, and then generally sprayed with alcohol, liquid alcohol, as it's cooling. And you'd think, well, that seems dangerous. I'm going to spray this piece that's you know, 1,800 degrees with water. Oh, boy, I hope it doesn't crack. Well, sometimes they do, but <laughs> that's just part of the process. And it produces these beautiful iridescence and and uh, copper tones, and some, some people have mastered this technique to bend at their whim, even though it's a complete, uh, it's a complete mystery to me how they do that. Um, there are glazed pieces in Raku that crack and smoke infiltrates into these cracks and it forms these beautiful black lines. It's just, uh, there's so many options you can do. Um, what I do is called naked Raku. Uh, naked raku implying that there are no glazes, there's no colorants on the clay. Um, the work of coloring the pieces is done simply by the smoke in the atmosphere that it's exposed to. Um, so I throw mostly on the wheel, um, and I prefer shapes, you know, something very traditional, amphoras, you know, Greek, this one's called a, a crater, K-R-A-T-E-R. Um, lidded urns and such. Um, I don't know, I just really like and like the shapes and the uh, shapes tend to play well with the processes that I like to put them through. Lots of surface area, lots of uh, opportunity for those designs to come through. Um, so the wheel thrown, they're bisque fired, which is the first stage of firing where you take it from just raw clay and you're actually starting the process of turning it to stone, something a bit more permanent. So at that point, it's heated to about cone 04, um, roughly 19, 1950 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and let cool for about a day just so that it can kind of, you know, recapitulate, re <laughs> kind of strengthen itself um, and um, become stone, because after that it goes through a real, real trial by fire. No pun intended. Maybe a little bit. Um, oh, that's hard to read. Okay, so this says on my screen, it's a lot easier to see. Uh, Naked Raku. And the piece in question, uh, where at least it's exposed, is doused in a thick slip. And it's a very specific formula that has to get played with at least the ratios to get just right uh, for it to crack but not fall off the piece. Um, but to crack enough where it lets the pattern come through. And it's, a, it's a little bit of trial and error, but once you get it, it's, oh, it's so sweet. 
Um, so it's doused in this thick slip. I mean, it's the consistency of pancake batter um, right, right before going into the kiln. And it's, I mean, I finished dousing this thing in this thick putty-like slip, and then I immediately will put it into a kiln that's already 1,200 degrees. And so it starts cracking and crazing as it can't handle the heat change. Um, the heat causes the wet slip to crack and form fissures, letting the smoke inundate the clay and forming a network of black lines across the surface. So there's a quick picture of applying slip. I choose to pour it. Now some artists will dip their pieces, but since I do a lot of two-tone work and I want to separate where the cracks are, uh, I choose to pour and, as you can see, mask off a great deal of the piece so that I get these nice crisp lines um, where the textures change. Um, so yeah, you can see that there's some differences in thickness. Those will provide different cracking and different, uh, uh, different looks to when the, in the finished piece. Where it's thinner, it's going to crack in a much more fine network of cracks and it's going to appear darker. Where it's thick, it might crack larger, but then you run the risk of it falling off in the kiln. I've had pieces where pretty much all the slip has just fallen off in the kiln. I'm watching it and it's just raining down off the piece. And I'm go, okay, well, once that goes into the combustibles, it's just going to be plain black. And that's not exciting for what I want them to be. So after the slip application, uh, they, again, immediately, don't let it dry, uh, goes right into a hot kiln. Um, and that's pulling it out. That is about 1,600 degrees. I like to pull my pieces. Um, you actually see there, those are tongs coming in, because well, you don't want to grab that. Um, and I actually have a leaf <laughs> actually stuck to that tong. Um, and that's a half second before I actually grab that piece, and that leaf just immediately combusted. I mean, it's in a, it is in such an environment that is so hot. Um, and so once you grab the pieces out, there's a race to get them into a barrel, a metal barrel of combustible materials. Um, you can use dry leaves, sawdust, wood chips, newspaper, anything that will burn, pretty much. Um, everything that will burn and won't leave a gross stain or, a, you know, resin, something like that. You can't use those shiny magazine style kind of things you get in the paper. It'll just cling to there. You'll never get the stuff off. Um, so it's plucked from the kiln, hot, and put into this barrel where everything immediately lights on fire. Obviously, flashpoint of, of, uh, of paper is 451 degrees, and this is, you know, almost four times that. So they, they comes alight immediately. Once it comes alight, I let it burn for a second, get a really good smoldering fire going, and then it's immediately covered up. And that creates the reduction environment, the lack of oxygen. What's happening there is I've created a whole bunch of smoke and fire. By covering it, I have depleted the inside of oxygen. So the fire needs oxygen. So where's it going to get the oxygen? It actually pulls the oxygen from the molecules in the clay. It's, it's looking for oxygen anywhere it can. So it actually ends up pulling it from the molecules in the clay and replacing them with carbon. It's where you get this black network of lines, or any area that's not covered turns black. And it's not just a soot covering, it's not looking like charcoal. It is actually in the clay. It has gotten chemically placed into the ceramic work. Um, now sometimes it's uh, not always <laughs> advantageous. Sometimes it doesn't go completely black, sometimes it turns brown or yellow in some cases, depending on what you're using. But I prefer to go with this really stark contrast of black and white, or as close as I can. Um, so I'm really going for that really good char. I think next I have, yeah, here's a short video I took, I think it was this, last, this past summer of the process. Is it pretty visible? You see what yeah. I'm doing? Yeah. All right, so that's my small kiln in my backyard. There's a beer can behind me. I'm not drinking the beer, of course, right? <laughs> totally, totally not. Not while I'm doing this. There's two beer cans. No. <laughs> so I've turned the propane off. Yeah, it's again, it's about 1,600 degrees or so. This is a lidded piece, so I'm going to go for the lid first. I'm going to take the lid off, put it into the small metal container. 
and that gets the fire going, as you can see, immediately. Go back for the actual piece itself. It's glowing red hot. Place it in the in the fire. Now this isn't one of the videos that will scare my mom to death, <laughs> but I've been known to reach my hand in there, gloved or otherwise. <laughs> so you can see there, I've closed it off. I let the fire go for a moment just to get it going and close it off. That stays in there for about 45 minutes, 45, not 45 minutes, 45 seconds to a minute before pulling it out. If I left it in there longer, you would get no contrast with the lines across the surface of the clay and um, you might risk cracking the clay by being in an environment that's also supplying more heat. Now you think, this is crazy, that's a lot of stress on this clay, right? That's, that's a ridiculous, because sometimes after this process, after the 45 seconds that it's in there, I will douse this in water. I'll actually put it in a bucket of water. And it sounds like this clay can't, you know, everyone's cracked a bowl or a cup or something. And you realize how easy it can be and you think, that's a lot of heat difference to go through in such a short amount of time. Why doesn't it explode? Well, they do. <laughs> they do sometimes in very violent ways. I've had sides of bottles blow out and go 10 feet across the room, hit the, hit the shed or my car in this case. Um, but it's a type of clay that has what's called really high grog. Um, grog is crushed, fired. Uh, ceramic, yeah, so it's basically a sand made out of already fired ceramic. If you put a lot of this grog into a clay, you lessen its ability to shrink and expand, thereby lessening its uh, wanting to crack when exposed to these crazy heat differences. Um, you could possibly do this with a low uh, grog clay to mixed results, expect some failures. Um, but what the clay I use is a really high grog. So it's really rough, it's like sandpaper when you're working with it, but then I burnish it really nice and smooth so that it has this really nice satin kind of tone. Push all that kind of sandy texture into the clay and really polish it. Yes, you brought up burnishing. Sorry, burnishing. Burnishing <laughs> is a way of smoothing uh, the clay body. Um, it's done before the piece is ever fired. It's done uh, with a variety of, um, of materials. Some people will use finely polished stones, quartz, or any hard stone. Um, some people will use the back of a spoon. Um, I use, generally, a um, piece of rubber that I have that is extremely smooth and actually in, in, in parts a really, really smooth texture on the pieces. And then I use a microfiber cloth uh, when the piece is a little bit harder, something I can handle and not worry about breaking, to really, really rub the thing down and really get a, a shine on it before it actually even ever goes into a kiln. Um, and burnishing was the way, like in smoke firing, where we talked about how shiny um, that blackware is. Oh. Yeah, so something like that. That would have been selectively. That is also burnished. That's quite nice. No, no. Oh, geez. Sorry. <laughs> Stay. Good boy. Okay. Um, so that would have been selectively burnished. So the areas where you can see the reflections obviously are that high you know, mirror polish. And the areas that are a little bit more pale, um, those would not have been burnished. Now it's... it's uh, these would have been done with stones and possibly a light coating of uh, thin oil, uh, vegetable or mineral oil, used to smooth the surface. And it is a rigorous, rigorous task. Is why some of these um, pieces, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of Maria Martinez, uh, you know, famous blackware potter. You know, she, obviously, she would spend hours and hours and hours burnishing her pieces because it would show in the end uh, her pieces don't have glaze on them. They don't have pigments. They are, they are what they are, so they have to appear um, pretty and smooth from the very beginning. Um, so it's the same kind of thing that uh, goes into the pit firing and the sagger firing we talked about. Begging your pardon. Yes. 
Yes, at the risk of sounding like a novice, how high does the temperature in the kiln can go? Um, it can go quite high. I mean, it can go, there are kilns rated up to, and Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, there's kilns that are rated up to cone uh, 14. And cone is the way you measure <laughs> ceramic heat. It is, it is an equivalent scale to uh, uh, Fahrenheit. But cone 14, I believe, is about 24, twenty four, like about 24, 24, 20 or so. So above 2400 degrees. Wow. Yeah. Um, now I'm firing at a much lower temperature, uh, at about 1900 degrees for the first firing, and then the actual Raku process I'm doing is at about 1600 degrees. I'm not sure how high my kiln can handle. I haven't tested that, um, and I don't really care to. <laughs> I kind of like my kiln. Um, anyway, so uh, that's burnishing and preparing the clay surfaces for these kinds of uh, for these kind of decoration. All right, so well, could you speak to um, sorry? when you put your pot into? The raccoon kiln, how long do you leave it in? Oh, sorry, uh, I probably should have said that. So, I raccoon my pieces, at least this style, one at a time. And right. you'll see in a lot of raccoon firings, they'll do an entire load of pieces. Right. They'll do dozen pieces or more at a time. I prefer to do mine one at a time, mostly because it is such, it is so imperative that they come out of that combustion area on a timely basis. If I had two or three of these, I wouldn't know which one was in for a minute, this one's in for 30 seconds, and I get all kinds of mixed results. Um, so I'll fire them, take them out, cover the kiln back up, and when I go back to put a new piece in that has slipped just freshly poured on it, the kiln is at 1200 degrees already. So it only takes 15 minutes for it to get back up to 1600 degrees or so. Okay. And how long then do you leave the piece in? Oh, uh, once it once it hits that 1600 degrees, I let it soak for about I don't know, a minute, two minutes. Let it really come up to temperature, and then off with the lid into the fire. <laughs> Maybe about 20 minutes total from yeah. the time you put it in mm -hmm. to the time you put it. Take yeah, it up, put and it of course the first piece takes about 40 minutes to get up to that temperature. <coughs> right. um, but after that, it's just it's a lot faster. Obviously, the kiln has done most of the work already, so it just has to get reheated. Mm -hmm. um, you can see in that still that there's blue fire shooting up out of the top. And my friends always uh, criticize me, make fun of me that I'm not afraid of it. I should be. <laughs> but yeah, as I said, I will reach into those barrels sometimes. I will lose a lid or something in one of those barrels. And of course, there's fire and there's smoke and everything. And I do have videos, and I will not show it, of me just reaching in and grabbing them. Because <laughs> I have to get the thing out, otherwise it's not going to look right. <laughs> you need to work up those calluses. They're there. <laughs> yeah, as Eric said, they're hot hands, killing hands. He can grab stuff. That I'm like, how the heck, how the heck did you just hold that? You cook, you can cook food on that. How do you know when it's 1600? So I have a, what's called a digital pyrometer. A pyrometer is kind of a fancy name for a thermometer. Um, so it's a digital display. It has a uh, probe, uh, kind of like you'd see in an external oven thermometer, a probe that goes into the side of the kiln and it's ac yeah, fairly accurately between, between 15 degrees either way. Uh, it'll tell you what temperature it is inside of that kiln. And, but the temperature inside the kiln might not necessarily reflect the temperature of the piece inside. Obviously the piece inside went a lot in at a lot cooler temperature than the kiln is. That's why you let it come up to heat, and you let it soak there for a little bit, let everything kind of, uh, kind of soak together, get nice and even heat. Um, are there any more questions on this? Yes. I don't know, how, does there any shrinkage in the piece through the first two, through the firing, through the wood? Oh, two? yes, of course. Uh, between, after it's made and dried, but it hasn't been fired yet, and then the biscuit and the raku firing, there's about 10% shrinkage. So it, it is now 90%, after this process, it's about 90% of the size that it was to start with. And that's something you have to take into account if you're making lids, you know, they have to shrink together, obviously, to fit. Um, this is something to also kind of marvel at, looking at your piece after it's done and going, Wait, where, where did it all go? What the heck? This is tiny. <laughs> Happens more often than not. And then in like the high fire, like what Eric teaches, it's sometimes more like 15 
and higher, right? Typically, yeah. yeah. And so you're losing, you know, 15% of your piece in shrinkage. And turns a, a teacup into a shot glass real quick sometimes. <laughs> um, That's why things warp and crack so often. Yes. Yeah, the clay is moving around constantly, and and the molecules are rearranging themselves all the time. Dan, is it possible to uh, fire raw clay on this? Uh, it is. In, in this process. It is. It's highly, highly unrecommended <laughs> um, because clay has to go through something called quartz inversion, and at about uh, between a thousand and eleven hundred degrees, that's when the molecules, the quartz molecules, actually start to become stone. They start, they actually um, change in their chemical nature. And this happens in the heating up process and the cooling down process. They actually move around and they eventually, again, correct me if I'm wrong, they align with magnetic north. That's what I've always read, is that the quartz molecules all, at this point, line up. And they all point magnetic north. That's how we can, that's how the human species can date pieces of pottery and we've learned so much about because when you look at the quartz crystals they're going with magnetic north so we could and that changes every year and we have a record of that so we can match the crystals in the clay to the magnetic north at that year in history and that's how we can date pottery which is pretty pretty fun yeah it is um, I, I want um, to answer Dan's question again um, quartz inversion is, is very important but if you take something that's just recently made and you want to get it through the mist firing process, you have to slow that down tremendously. So you couldn't do what Brooke is doing, which is going from cold to 1600 degrees in 40 minutes. It, you would have to really, especially because before quartz inversion, uh, the physical water has to evaporate and then there's chemical water that has to evaporate and, and leave the piece. And that has to happen slowly, otherwise it'll explode. Yeah, physical water leaves between you know, boiling point, 212, and about 350. That's when you see a lot of steam and stuff coming out of your out of the kiln. You get an interesting smell. Then chemical water starts burning off at around 600 degrees. That's water actually in the in the molecules of the clay. And once that's actually what causes a lot of the shrinkage too, is the water and the organic materials burning off. Then after that, you get sulfur burning off, which creates a really neat smell. The neighbors love it. Um, and yeah, as as Eric said, that you have to do this really really slowly. And we're talking, you know. I do it at a really, really fast rate at about 200 degrees an hour, and sometimes faster. Um, and that's really fast. Here, there's what a, t how long is your bisque period here? It's what, three days? Uh, no, uh, it, takes about, it takes about 17 hours to fire a bisque kiln. Right, uh, and to and cool. slower in the front. Yeah, and then, and no, uh, to cool is about 36 yeah. hours total. Yeah. yeah, so it has to be a really, really slow, slow process. So you could, in theory, take it out after it's reached that critical temperature. Again, it's not gonna be strong. It's not gonna go, it's not gonna have gone through the second phase of quartz inversion. And more than likely it's gonna break. Now some people will, I've seen potters do this where they will actually put glaze, you know, like what you'd use on a functional piece of ceramics onto a piece of what they call greenware, which is clay that has not been fired at all yet. And they will fire it all the way through its process um, without bisque firing it the first time, and those people are daring, and I don't it's, know. <laughs> it's possible if you have a really good understanding of the ceramic chemistry and that what, what it takes to do that. A lot of commercial dinnerwares and things are made and, and fired once all the way up to the 2300 degrees, uh, but they have uh, ceramic engineers on staff who understand the chemistry in the clay, the chemistry in the glaze, and how exactly how efficiently that kiln can be fired to do that. So I've always kind of described what, what what we do in ceramics is like we're like scientists that are too interested to take down notes. We're just kind of fascinated by it. So we have to have a there's a learning curve to this, and and, and we go through a lot of failure uh, to do that. And, and even with what Brooks doing now for the success that he's having, is there's a built-in amount of failure. He's talking about the pieces exploding. Oh yeah, and um, a piece. Yes. So you've shown a lot of different kinds of firing, and mm -hmm. all of those firing. Were they on bisqueware or were they on greenware? Um, well, the pit firing, the sagger firing, and the raku uh, are all done primarily with bisqueware. The blackware, the one we looked at in the smoke firing, and they don't always turn out black, the reds and 
uh, beautiful browns and yellows, um, but the most famous generally are the blackware. Um, those are done usually with greenware. They, so those go in not being bisque at all, mostly because they didn't have kilns to bisque them to begin with. So this is how they fired. This is how they fired functional pieces. This is how they would carry uh, liquids and, and food and everything. Uh, and that was another reason of burnishing them to a really high sheen. It was that it was a protective and a little bit safer finish than just leaving the clay raw. Um, yes? If you put in a kiln and it all falls down, yeah. can you refire it? <clears throat> you can, yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, I did this the other night. I was doing a firing, and I looked into my kiln, and for some reason, all the slip had just fallen off. I don't know why. Sometimes this just happens. Um, and so it hadn't really gone up too high in temperature. It was about 800 degrees or so. So I shut the kiln off, waited for it to cool a little bit, and I pulled that piece out, and I poured more slip back on it and threw it back in the kiln. While it was warm? While it was warm. Um, and I've actually refired pieces. If I wasn't happy with the pattern, I've actually, that same night, I'll scrape off all the, the excess slip, coat it back on there, and throw it back in. And I've fired pieces three or four times before I was happy with the pattern. Um, and again, the clay doesn't like that kind of heat transfer <laughs> that much, so once in a while those kind of things uh, tend to crack. but. One of my favorite pieces, I fired three times before I got a, a pattern that was I was happy with. Actually, it's in a slide coming up. All right, is there any more questions about getting, this question? Are you firing them multiple times, are mm -hmm. you getting patterns over patterns? No, actually what happens is those black lines that we saw, at that temperature, burn back out. So, actually those lines and all the black, if I had thrown a piece that was, um, So like that, that has the black um, non-treated top part and then all the black network of lines. I can throw that back in the kiln at about 1800 degrees and all of that burns right back up. So it's, it's pure white again. So kind of a blank slate. And you are stressing the clay out quite a bit by doing that over and over and over again. But uh, yeah, and that can all be reversed essentially and redone. Yes? Well, actually it's just a comment. It looks like uh, if instead of uh, you being involved in art, it seems more like an exact science. In um, the application of temperatures, yeah, like temperature what, variations. And yeah, like what Eric said, you know, we're scientists that don't like to take notes. And we, you know, <laughs> we, we get a lot of, uh, a lot of trial and error. But um, it, it, there is a lot of science to it. But I think it's all for an artistic end. At, at the end of the day, you know, we're doing this because we want a certain finish, we want a certain tone, we want to evoke a certain emotion uh, on our pieces and kind of do whatever we have to do to get that. <laughs> and if that takes uh, doing a little bit of chemistry, then that's fine, you know? Yeah, yeah. we got to make what we got to make, right? Yeah. Um, Brooke, um, yes, I had the, was real fortunate to be with uh, Paul Soldner uh, at one point years and years ago. Really? And, that's awesome. Um, he told the story of when um, that whole thing started mm -hmm. um, with him discovering kind of Raku. Mm -hmm. He said um, he'd taken the pot out of the kiln and this gigantic wind came and mm -hmm. blew it off of the stand or whatever he had yeah. and it rolled down this hill yeah. into a pile of leaves. Yeah, I'd heard that. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> he said that's how that all started. Yeah. And, and, and the, the meaning behind Raku itself is um, happiness by chance. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was kind of that whole thing. Yeah. Was really happiness by chance. Yeah. It's a, it embraces a Japanese tradition called wabi-sabi, mm -hmm. which is the beauty, beauty in imperfection, and to embrace imperfection, not be angered by it or not be discouraged by it, but to accept that. Anything humans make, no matter how perfect it looks, it is not perfect. Uh, and especially anything that nature makes is completely imperfect. Don't fight it, embrace it, live with it, love it. Um, I, that's what I, I try to do in daily, daily life. Embrace the imperfections because we can't certain, change it. <laughs> there are certain traditions that will that they, if they get so good at making whatever it is they're making, they'll purposely mm -hmm. put in something a little crooked for the lobby side. They'll they'll put a crack in a column of a temple, just on purpose. I was because, talking to a Mennonite. He said they call it cat, cat, catawampus. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Is that where that comes from? <laughs> catawampus. <laughs> um, all right. So we can move on. 
Are there any qu other questions about the, the firing mm -hmm. process? Yeah, then? Another one, yeah. Okay. One more question. Yes. Does the color of your powdery require different temperatures of firing? Not necessarily. Now, um, pretty much at a temperature that's enough to ignite those combustibles, it's primarily going to turn black. Now, again, you will get some variation with that depending on what kind of combustibles you're using. You'll get some yellows and some browns, grays, but it's not like if I fired it higher, I'd get like reds or anything like that. Um, that is different in glaze firings um, and certain <laughs> techniques therein um, where you get a little bit different tones the higher or lower you go, or in Raku, what kind of uh, environment you then expose them to. Um, you know, certain glazes will go a lot darker if exposed to a, a dark reduction environment, meaning lots of smoke, lots of combustion. Um, and some don't even get that at all. Some are pulled out of the kiln and set in the open air, uh, as traditional Raku Yaki was, um, just to air cool. And like what Paul Solner was doing before it <laughs> turned <laughs> south, um, but eventually turned into something kind of magical that thousands of people are doing today. Um, so, oops, see that. so this is that sacrificial slip, the slip I poured on there before. This is what it looks like right after it comes out of the kiln. And this is, this is probably too hot to be touching with my bare hands anyways, but again, I'm not very bright. Um, this stuff ideally, ideally falls right off. Um, and there's that, there's that chemistry line where you have to have this perfect Goldilocks zone of it not falling off in the kiln, but falling off once it's out, otherwise it's gonna get stuck. And I have a video of one of these pieces, and this is right out of the kiln again with the, with the slip. And this is how you reveal this pattern. Now this, is, this is when it's coming off perfectly. <laughs> it doesn't always do that, but I love it when it comes off. Um, the photo on the left is actually just from the other night, and you can see the difference in uh, how tightly the cracking pattern is. I've, I've gone to applying the slip a lot more thin and letting it crack in a lot, lot tighter network of lines. I just tend to prefer that um, for the time being, at least. We'll see. <laughs> so if the slip stays on like that, you just kind of chip it away with a fingernail? Yeah. It's at some points you have to take a you know a, a single edge razor blade to it to get it off, but it generally doesn't take that much encouragement. And then these pieces pieces are scoured. I scour them uh, with water and scouring pads um, in order to get the last remaining bits off of it and to take any kind of discoloration out. I can hopefully I can, um, and then they're left to dry. And then I seal the pieces um, with an acrylic sealer. Um, to, to protect it mostly to, you know, if a drop of water lands on these things, I don't want it soaking in and staining the piece or anything like that. It's mostly to protect it and to give back some of the shine that I put on it initially in the burnishing process. Um, but yeah, it's, it, this is like Christmas morning. This part is amazing. This, it's like, did, did it go well? Did it go well? Sometimes you think, ah, crap, no, that's not good. So you walk, walk over to the slip, you pour more on, you throw it back in the kiln and hope for the best, and eventually it explodes. And it's, it's a good night. It's a good way of spending an evening, honestly. I prefer to do this at night, too, because I can tell the colors. Even if my pyrometer, my temperature gauge isn't on, I can tell by the color of the clay where I need to be, um, how, what color it's glowing, red or orange hot, however it is. Um, and also the fire is pretty cool, I don't know. <laughs> um, and so recently I've started adding copper accents. Um, I hand forge, um, meaning I take copper stock, hammer it out under heat, um, bending it, soldering it, um, brazing it, fusing it together, uh, drilling and tapping holes in it to get it to fit to these pieces. And none of these pieces are glued on they're all mechanically fastened. Uh, the tops are screwed into place like you would a dresser pole or a drawer pole. Um, the rings are left open so that when I go to put them through the clay, they are crimped closed and they're not ever coming out. <laughs> um, 
And ones like these that have this kind of rotunda at the top with these copper pillars, the pillars actually drop down through the, the top. And I'm working on better ways of doing that uh, that are a little bit more secure. And those are uh, in prototype mode right now. We'll see. We'll see how they turn out. Um, but those have become commonplace in my work as of late, which I'm really enjoying. It gives that kind of pop of, uh, of a blue-green to an otherwise kind of drab gray and black um, piece. Uh, um, I want these pieces to kind of evoke the idea of, uh, of, a, of maybe a recovered vessel you know, from a shipwreck or it was pulled up in an archaeological dig, something like that. I love the, the shapes of, uh, of antiquity and, and uh, bringing these, trying to bring these to life in a little bit different way that uh, still pays homage to it. I, 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 love, I love playing with these shapes and these ideas. Um, again, I, I antique all of these. Uh, it takes about four days to a week to apply a patina on these bare copper pieces. Um, and it's reapplication of vinegar and salt and ammonia and letting it sit and grow these crystals and scraping these crystals off and it, you know, it's a lot of fun but it's an exercise in patience to be certain. Yes? Why are you selling it? I'm sorry? Why are you selling it? I'm not much. I'm actually building a, I'm building a body of work right now to have a solo show so I'm really not selling at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Soon. <laughs> Soon. The website is in construction right now so we're, we're working on it. Um, oh, so this piece on the right is what I was talking about. That piece I fired three times in one night just to try to get a, a pattern that I liked out of it. Um, but these are just some examples. Um, I've started using, on the middle piece, you can see that the tops, the areas that don't have that crackle finish are a little bit brown. It's because I actually applied a thin um, iron oxide uh, wash to the piece before the actual bisque firing. <laughs> to kind of differentiate the, uh, the areas that get the uh, naked raccoon treatment and ones that don't. Um, so can you make sure we're clear on what is clay body and what is metal in those pieces? Sorry, the only thing that are metal on these are the rings in the top, the rings hanging down. Everything else is clay. As a, I try to make them look as if they might be metal, but they are clay. <laughs> um, I think I have only... Yep, so that's my last piece. I want to say thank you, everyone, for, thank you. for watching. Thank you. Thank you.